very special movie. Uh, I'd like to bring up Lodge Kerrigan and Damian Lewis. It? <laughs> well, I was going to say, I, that's something I was going to mention. I do have to think this movie is quite funny. Um, I guess I just want to start by saying I love this film. And uh, it holds a special place for me, Lodge, because it's the first film of yours that I saw before I'd kind of gone back and seen um, Clean Shaven and Claire Donald. So it kind of holds a very special place. So I'm particularly happy about the restoration and the life that it will have for, for years to come. And um, and Damon, uh, you're so damn good in this. And I, I'd be, I'd be, you know. Um, I'd be lying if I didn't say that. I didn't, I don't, I don't want to use the word steal, but I definitely drew uh, inspiration for a particular film that I did, which uh, we can talk about later, because, you know, it's not about me, um, but uh, uh, yeah, it's 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 truly special. Um, I guess. Uh, oh, and um, we'll open up questions to the audience um, towards the end. Um, the first sort of, I guess, broad question um, that I had. I want to talk a bit about the kind of technical aspect of the restoration, but just on a purely. Uh, emotional level for the both of you like what is it what does it feel like to, to revisit it now do you is there a detachment do you feel removed from it do you feel um, uh, you know joking aside do you still like it you know do you still like do you what is yeah well what is it what does it feel like to revisit it now and to see it again on the big screen are you gonna do that all night <laughs> well, you've been watching it because you've been part of the remastering. I, I haven't seen it for right. a while, and it was always a um, it was always a personal movie for me for obvious reasons. I'm, I'm very connected to this film in terms of my screen time, and um, I uh, I think it's exquisite to see it again actually, and um, it's, uh, I, I love, I just, I, I love, I love the very subtle turns all the way through it. I've forgotten about the menace that exists in it uh, alongside the thriller element. I had forgotten the beautiful, just quite how exquisitely large mirrors right at the end, the, um, when he's there with Little Miss Sunshine. <laughs> at the end, um, mirroring his own experience with his daughter. There were lots of conversations at the time about whether he had invented the whole thing in his mind. Um, I think Lodge and I always agreed, well, Lodge wrote it, and uh, it was always clear that it had actually happened. It was real. Um, and um, and that, that heart-stopping moment where you think he's going to abduct this lady's child and then doesn't is, is, is just done quietly in a nuanced, subtle, but devastatingly effective way at the end. You, you made an amazing film. You made an amazing film. And um, I, feel, I feel very lucky to yeah, see I just want to say that I think we made the film, Damien, and with a lot of people to go to I, you know, it was, um, you know, when I first got this script, I looked at it and I went, hell yes, that's got awards written all over it. <laughs> that is like the greatest hits of, you know, behavioral problems. And I'm going to go to town with this. It's fantastic. And I thought, and I wasn't sure, I had to read it and reread it. It says, but does, does this add up? to more than that, and then um, 
Lodge came to stay with me for two days in London. He said, if we're going to do this, I'm going to come and stay with you for two days over a weekend, and we're going to workshop this together in your house. I said, sure, I love that. No, no one would usually take the time. He flew to London, and we spent two days, and at the end of that, I knew exactly that I was going to make this film, and that the, the narrative drive was absolutely intact, and that it wasn't going to be a, you know, uh, put on the hump, develop the limp, you know, grow the hairy mole on the face. It was going to be nuanced and subtle and, and directed beautifully. So, yeah, and this is the first time I've come back to it in a long while. Feels good. Does feel good, yeah. Um, Lodge, you want, can you just talk a little bit about um, the technical aspect of, re like, it, during the restoration, did you have, um, let's say, urges to even go re-edit? Or, you know, would, that, how did you, did it feel like being in an editing, editing room? Or, or talk a bit about that. Sure. Okay. Um, yeah. I think it's a really interesting question. Uh, the, I was very fortunate that Christina Bowden, who I've worked with, was a wonderful editor. Um, she cut Claire Dolan. Yeah. And my episodes of The Girlfriend Experience, um, both those seasons, um, that we supervised the restoration remastering together and we were in it we were discussing Claire Dolan because we'd like to remaster that if I can find the money to do it um, and we were talking about would we go in and re-edit it or not and I think it's for me it's a really interesting question I think it extends to not only to film but to other um, mediums of art you know how much do you go in when you're revisiting a work restoring it or cleaning it up or changing it, how much do you go in and change something that was documented at a specific period? Um, there were some things that I wanted to do, um, pretty minor, I think, in, in, in the grand scheme of things, uh, with, with Keen and Moore, uh, actually about use of music, uh, which is very, very minimal. But I decided at the end not to do it uh, because I felt that the I stand by it. You know, I made this yeah. film when I made it 2004. It's a document of that period, and although I can go in and deal with color re color balancing and, and shaping the light a little bit in, in the remastering, um, I didn't want to move away from that intent yeah. of, of what it really was. And, even if now I look back and go like, oh, I, I can see areas, even with other films, you know, like when I watched uh, Clean Ship, and I, I only watch a, a film usually once with an audience. Uh, it's not a steadfast rule, but usually once. Uh, and then I move on um, until I remaster it. Uh, so I watched Clean Shaven recently because it was being re-released in Japan. I felt like, ooh, I could really re-edit this. <laughs> I could really go in and re-edit, and I hope I'm not being vain, but I think actually it kind of improved some areas of it. Uh, but I thought that, that that's just, that's kind of not right. Let it lie, yeah, in yeah. that way. It you know, that, that I have to look back, and that was a period when I was with Clean Shaven, a very young filmmaker starting, and that's a document of that time. So to go back years later and re-edit it, I think, um, wouldn't be true to to the period and, and yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. Um, Damien, I wanna talk uh, I'm very interested in some of the hardships of this part. Mm -hmm. And because again, because you do it so well. Um, there's a few I wanna talk about, but one I wanna specifically talk about is voicing interior thoughts. Well, actually, hold on. I want to start here. the the feeling The feeling of the camera almost kind of being like a shadow, and had a had a sort of. I assume you know you're sort of dancing with it, you know, or or treating it like a I don't know what a friend or something, you know. So the yeah, um, 
how did that feel? The kind of dance with the camera and also voicing interior thoughts on screen. You know, what would normally be in other movies, I feel like done with a voice over, you know what I mean? And then the actor can sort of just live and breathe and then, but, but having to sort of do that yourself, I imagine for, I'm, for me, that would be difficult to, to accomplish the way you did. Uh, it was it, that that was one of the hardest things to overcome and get right and not feel self-conscious about doing um and um actually lodgers always ask asking me you just take it down take it down take it down take it down let's get it as wherever you can get it just down to a whisper so it's as internal and as intimate as possible yeah. the advantage of the whisper or the, the talking right from the very beginning which you feel is an expression of internal thoughts, is is it then as he becomes, as the audience becomes aware that he's not well, um, it becomes a man talking to himself. Right. So uh, it serves a dual purpose in, in that respect. Um, uh, in terms of the camera, uh, John Foster was our brilliant, brilliant, uh, steady-handed cinematographer, operator, and. Um, it was it, it it was both those things. It became a friend, and I enjoyed the dance, actually. And it's an odd thing that actors have to do, which you'll appreciate simultaneously, is immerse yourself entirely in an alternative reality, and be yeah. in that world imaginatively entirely, whilst at the same time being aware of the dance with the camera. So you are trying to do two things at once all the time. Um, and initially, of course, yeah, it felt obtrusive. John had to figure out uh, where the camera was gonna be. It feels utterly spontaneous, the whole thing. That's only because we rehearsed every single camera move and every scene for a long time before we shot it. He only had four minute films in a lighter camera. So, and there were a couple of scenes which you remember ran to 357, 358. And we're thinking, oh fuck, we're not gonna get it in time. And it's been a great take and we've been rehearsing it for two hours. And now it's gonna be too slow and we're not gonna, it's not gonna get, it's gonna be unusable. But as, as, so John had to learn the scenes on the day and learn when to go, when not to go, when to go, when not to go. And, um, that was a that was an enormous task for him, wasn't it, Lodge? That he rose to, sometimes struggled with, and but rose to it uh, incredibly, right? I mean, over all, the course all the, of the movie, the, there's only um, all the coverage in the film. It's one shot per scene. That's it. The only the, all the editing is in camera and was worked out beforehand, and the only edits are jump cuts right? you know, to try to unsettle the character, unsettle the pace, unsettle the audience too. So it was... Uh, I remember teasing you halfway through. It's going, one establishing shot, Lodge. Come on, pull back. <laughs> Just one wide, and then let's punch it. <laughs> one, give well, me one. There is the bus station. The, yeah. That's, <laughs> yeah. But yeah, no, but it's true. I mean, I think there's a lot of actors too have this like sort of silly attitude sometimes, like, well, I'm going to have a performance and it's up to the camera to catch it. And I think it's uh, it's kind of silly. And I think the way you sort of work with the camera, like, you, you know, you need it to capture the performance and uh, it's very um, unselfish and beautiful. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I mean, do you think, uh, Laj, do you think, just as a hype, kind of fun hypothetical, do you think you can make this movie now? I think you can. I think it's sort of, I mean, I do, I think that, I think that Keen is sort of timeless in that way. I mean, besides the fact that, you know, Penn Station also basically looks the same, you know, <laughs> that it does now. But, uh, uh, so does Damien. That's right, yeah. you do, you look fantastic. We can all agree on that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So shall we? Just do it again. Not a sequel, just do it again. I'm here for one more day, and so are No, do you, do you think, I think it can. That's all. That's my. Opinion. You know, I have to say one one of the, the the three things I took from it when I was restoring it, watching it, and I hadn't seen it since two thousand and five, maybe I think so. It had been some time, and um, 
one that it, it felt still very much of the moment. I felt um, that this could take place in New York City. Um, two, I was still really struck by just how electric and alive Damien's performance is. Um, and I also think that uh, Abigail's performance plays Kira, the young girl, is just so mm -hmm. remarkable. Mm -hmm. She's so present. Mm -hmm. Like she, you, you just see her listening and mm. this information. You can see her, her responding to it without, like, really being completely present. Yeah. And and Amy Ryan gave this absolutely beautifully nuanced performance in it. Um, and I was really taken as an audience member and as a filmmaker. One of the most important things for me is just life in front of the camera. Mm. Like. I don't know where it's going to go. Like I want to be where where it's it's dangerous in some way. You have no idea where what's going to happen. And I think watching this, that's really what I felt again. Like I had no idea what was, even though obviously I I, I knew, but um, but it felt alive. It felt on edge. It felt uh, somewhat dangerous and. The third thing I thought was, you know, I, I shot a lot, I wrote a lot of this and shot, well, I wrote mm. it all in Port Authority. I would go around with those interior monologues walking in Port Authority from one uh, gate to another, mumbling out the words, writing them down. <laughs> and I'm sure people thought that I was completely crazy. <laughs> and working it out and, and then going uh, into the street towards the Lincoln Tunnel and walking that area and going over into New Jersey and to Bergen County and those motels and figuring it all out to try to capture the energy. But but I wanted to shoot in live environments. And, and, uh, and then I wanted to shoot one shot per scene. Mm. And Steven Soderbergh, the executive producer, was like, go do it. It sounds, it sounds amazing, go do it. But a lot of my friends and colleagues were like, that's totally insane what you're going to do. I mean, it's really crazy. And watching the, what I was, I was, I'm still young, but I was younger then. And, uh, and I thought um, then at that period, I was like, of course I'm going to do it. Like, yeah. oh, there's no, I'm just doing it. Like that's that's it. But when I watched it now, it was like, you were totally crazy. Yeah. <laughs> like that's insane. But at the same time, what I want to say uh, is that I think these films at that at this budget level, these small films. We do, I mean, Damien mentioned the '90s and independent cinema and all. I still think great small work outside the commercial arena is being made today and companies of people like Ryan and companies like Grasshopper are instrumental in getting it to, to audiences and there is an audience for it. Um, but I think these are the kinds of the films to take risks, right? to really go out and do it. You know? So you say, would I go out and make it? I probably wouldn't, but I would encourage somebody else to go do yeah. it. <laughs> It's it's sort of a, it's a what I, another thing that I kind of find wild about this is a um, a lead character that is not only essentially going through a psychotic break you know in, in real time, but um, uh, one that only interacts with strangers for an entire film. There's not there's no context of let's say you know a family member or anything to sort of give backstory to to this kind of uh to that kind of character and that's that's sort of a why you know to you i think it, it it makes it feel i think like a documentary in that way you know you're you're sort of um you're sort of living it with with, with damien and I, it's it's not necessarily a question but it's just something that I, that I, I noticed that i think is pretty remarkable well, i think damien mentioned before that we decided very early on uh that uh keen had a daughter and that she was abducted because you you can't you can't act and you can't if, please correct me if I'm wrong but you can't act uh, ambiguity and you know you have to know yeah. on some level and you certainly can't direct it either uh, so we chose that um, that she did have a daughter but I wanted to express it when uh, through the behavior through his behavior I think if you look at the character and how he interacts with Kira in his behavior. To me, it's apparent he's a parent. 
because of the patience that he takes with the child. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and in the writing that I do, I really dis, I mean, it's just for myself and there's no right or wrong way, but I tend to shy away from exposition. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm not particularly interested in when characters um, explain their emotional life through dialogue. I just, I, as an audience member, honestly, I kind of switch off and I'll go watch a film with a friend and somebody will say, what did they say? And I have no idea because I just stopped paying attention. <laughs> um, but as a writer, I just find it really, I, I just not interested in that. What I'm interested in more is, is from a more voyeuristic level, just trying to watch people and see how they behave and what the context is that gives clues to what perhaps they might want or what they're trying to communicate, even if they're aware of it themselves. And so I find that then that's what I try to write in most characters. And I think it continues into you know television work like in The Girlfriend is for us. Um, this, and the characters then I think the they become, for me, more interesting because you're trying to figure out who they really are. Like in real life, people just don't reveal themselves to you. You have to go really pay attention to the small cues that they're giving behaviorally. And of course, yes, through their dialogue also, as I'm sure every analyst will say. But, um, but I think that that's really, for me, what's fascinating. And so that's what I try to write and, and to try to draw an audience in that you have to determine for yourself, you know, what's what's going on, who this character really is. Damon, do you, um, the, a moment that I particularly like is uh, in the ice skating rink when um, you sort of, you, like I think as the audience, you sort of forget about his psychosis, you know, because he's, so, how, how he is with Kira. And, um, and the sort of moment where you sort of feel like he's putting it, he's had a cap on it for so long, and then it just needs to come out again, you know, when he sort of uh, explodes more or less on, on the, the strangers. Um, was that another difficult, you know, to like, to sort of play with the, uh, the different levels of that and letting it come out, letting, um, yeah, just the different, you know, I've, I forgot, I forgot about that and in that moment, and I thought you did such a, um, sort of great job of sort of uh, sort of painting all like the that graph of, of this person. Uh, yeah, thank you. I, um, it was enjoyable. It was, th those moments were enjoyable. It was yeah. a, it was an opportunity to le lean into what we've been discussing. You know that he had been a good parent yeah. and um, had had this terrible moment. He also has more money than everyone else in the film, <laughs> which is interesting. And you learn that as you're going along. So he's okay. He's in the welfare motel, but he's always got a bit of cash to get some coke or whatever, <laughs> give a hundred bucks. And we also talked about that. You know, who was this guy really? A middle class, stable guy with a house, whose life unraveled, you know, quickly over a short period of time because of this dreadful, dreadful thing that happened. You know, maybe it started with the divorce, mm -hmm. you know, which we have to assume is real. Maybe got out some debt, didn't have a house, he lost his daughter, and now he's wondering, now he's one of the guys in Port Authority. I used to go to Port Authority every morning and stand next to a woman called Tina, who told me every morning that she just performed the night before with Ike. <laughs> and, and, and I would talk to her every morning about how the gig went. And she said, well, I said, is Ike still hitting you? He said, he hits me sometimes. Sometimes he doesn't hit me. And I said, where do you wash? And she'd come into Port Authority. And she'd use the public toilets. Mm -hmm. And she was sleeping. She was managing to find buses that she could sleep on and hide at the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. And then she'd come out and she'd line up with five other guys and ladies right outside Port Authority on the, on the, on the pavement. I'm British. On the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, stand stand all day long talking to themselves, shifting from side to side. It's where I got a lot of my research from because we spent two weeks uh, before we filmed, didn't we? Actually going out to some of these welfare motels. And, um, yeah, you know, so it, it's, very, it's, very, it's very Shakespearean what we're talking about. You yeah. know, Shakespeare just puts people on stage and they act. Right. He's pre-Freud, doesn't need a lot of backstory, and you learn 
from the characters as they act. Yeah. Through their actions, you learn about them. You learn they are evil. You don't, they don't tell you why they're evil. You know, they had, you know, daddy issues. Right. You know. That's right. It's pre Freud. It just, they act, and you discover through the course of the play, through their actions. That's what's fantastic. That's right. That's what about this. And film. as heartbreaking as a movie, again, I do also find it very funny in moments. Wait, is it? I mean, it's, I mean, you know. Surprisingly I mean, funny. It's, it's surprisingly times. funny. It's, you know, interaction with the, the hotel, you know, known. Anyway. Okay. Um, let's uh, open up to the audience if anyone wants any questions. Um, oh, do I have to do this? I've never had to. All right, I'm just going to start in the front. Okay, thank you. First of all, thank you for sharing this beautiful film with us. I watch. Oh, you want to do you want mine? Is that yeah. COVID friendly? Yeah. 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 yeah, fresh one. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much for sharing this beautiful film with us. Uh, I've watched it many times before but it's really intense on big screen. It's a beautiful, beautiful uh, film. Uh, my question is for Damien. Uh, I've read one of the recent interviews of Mr. Kerrigan where he said he saw you in Band of Brothers and he was tempted to cast you in Keen. And as far as I know, Keen was also instrumental in getting you the role in Homeland, Nick Brody, which is my all-time favorite <laughs> fictional character. So thank you, Keith. Thank you, Mr. Kerrigan. Do you want to give some insight to us, to us about it? I'm really trying to keep that quiet from lunch. <laughs> then he's going to start asking for checks. Uh, yeah. Now, there is a lovely little thing in there, and I'll share it. A little bit of showbiz gossip, I guess. A little Good. industry inside scoop. Thanks, Kaha, for the question. Yes. When they were trying to cast Homeland, uh, they were struggling to cast Brody. And it was another East Coast independent director who I admire very much called Michael Cuesta. I made a film called LIE back in the day, around the same sort of time. And he had been brought on as the lead director of Homeland. And they couldn't cast Brody. They'd already got Claire and they already had Mandy. And he said, Watch this movie. I'm a huge fan of the director. It's a remarkable movie. This is Keen. It's back in the day when you still got your Netflix on a, on a CD. <laughs> and they weren't all available. Uh, some you could get. You, do you remember the time you had to either order the CD or, you, or it was uploaded already? The other films. Yeah. So Alex Ganser, who wrote it, uh, looked it up. And he told me this story later. He said, if I had had to order the CD and waited a day for it to arrive, I wouldn't have bothered. But because someone had paid for the rights for it to be already uploaded on Netflix, so I said, I sat down and watched 20 minutes of it. It was 11 o'clock at night, and I went home 90 minutes later at one in the morning, having watched the whole thing. And then they came and asked me to be Brody. So, um, thanks Lodge for that. <laughs> um, and I was then able to return the favor again Michael Cuesta, instrumental in this, when Lodge was an, an, a renowned indie filmmaker, but was not making much TV at the time. I think it was the first TV job. The first thing, and we said, well, everyone loved Keen, and that's why I'm here. He can obviously direct. Let's get him in for an episode. And that led, indirectly, I suppose, to the girlfriend experience, which Lodge then, you know, um, show ran. So. It's all just one big happy family out there. <laughs> I think we, yeah, in the back there. Yeah. Yeah, hi. Hey, she's over here. You guys talked a little bit about the preparation and, and all the workshopping you did. Um, when you're shooting in New York, and especially at the Port Authority, there must be a lot of things that happen that you weren't able to prepare for, because I mean, it's New York in general, just things just happen. I was curious if that was the case when you were shooting uh, this movie, and if anything ended up in the, in the movie, just from happenstance and things like that. It's a really interesting question. Uh, I think we were, there was something, at least from my memory, nothing highly unusual. Uh, it was just more really just people entering the frame. You know? It was really like, are you making a movie? It's amazing when you have a camera and some actors okay. that people will walk by and go like, 
are you making a movie? <laughs> and you're three and a half minutes into a four minute take. You have no coverage. You've already done seven takes. And they go, well, are you making a movie? <laughs> I was trying to. <laughs> uh, so really, um, you know, the, I was really, like, how, how can I articulate this? And I've done just a number of interviews recently, so you think it'd be relatively easy at this point. Um, Damien and I spent time together, and then in the rehearsal process, we spent a lot of time on the locations where we were going to film. And we invited John Foster, the DP, also. Uh, so we really, and, and I didn't set up traditional rehearsals. I didn't stage a scene, anything like that. We just read through the material and discussed the character and improvised some scenes for the actors to really own their character and own their dialogue. Um, and by the time we started shooting, we had sp spent, I think that that allowed the actors, Damien and, and Abigail and, and Amy, to really, uh, I think, understand their character and start to answer questions that actors pose themselves uh, very early on the process. So everything was really kind of clear very early on. And when it came time to shooting, um, a lot of the technical questions had been answered. We, we definitely were discussing in-camera editing, when to pan off somebody for how long, um, which is very difficult, um, as I found out at that time. Um, you made um, some rewrites as well, even for, yeah. from those sessions. Sure, didn't sure. You? Yeah. yeah, we did some rewriting. Um, but. When we started, I think we had a really unspoken communication between us, um, with John also. Like there wasn't, there, we really didn't talk a lot on the set. There weren't a lot of questions. And I saw that Damien uh, was in the zone very early. And all I tried to do, and particularly in Port Authority, all I really tried to do was like step out of the way. But that was really it. I tried, I saw it, I saw the energy was right, and I just did my best to get the crew to focus as, as much as we could and to capture it as quickly as we could without having a lot of on-set banter and, you know, like, um, so in that sense, it was because we were shooting in live environments, it really lent itself to that. It was more of, I wouldn't say documentary filmmaking, but the focus because you are in a live environment and I'm doing something crazy like shooting one shot per scene. You know, everyone is super focused on it. Um, yeah, and, you know, it, and it was, it looked, it's a low budget film. You know, we had 10 background artists or 20 maybe right, on a good right, day right. who we would position in behind me. So it was trying to knock out yeah. the bogeys to use the technical term of you know citizens you know walking by and looking over shoulders and, going, <laughs> and so the, these 10 or 20 background artists were just rotated you know literally walk out put a different hat on and you know so you could just keep the whole thing moving i will say another thing about making these long takes do you remember working with abigail who is phenomenal but she was an eight nine year old girl how old was she eight or nine year old girl. So you do a four minute take. I was boom, there, couple of takes. Abigail wasn't. So we'd have to wait for Abigail to warm up a little bit. Right. At that point, I've gone off the boil. So for the take three, four, and five, you know, he's going, Damien, can you get this together? She's really cooking now. And I, well, I was cooking early on. <laughs> and you know, so then we'd get around to, you know, and it'd be take six, seven, eight. And that's why in the process, it was painstaking actually, yeah. wasn't it? For some of those longer scenes, we wouldn't be gelling together until later on, those later takes. Yeah. Because there was no, there, there, there was, there's no cut. There's no coverage to come in and out of different performances for different takes. And then you're running three minutes or you know, three and a half minute takes. And just praying that somebody is going to go, are you making a movie? <laughs> um, Someone just gave me a signal. 
but to convince. Yeah. We made a movie. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thanks very much.